The following episode contains drug references. Stony Roads and our partners do not condone the use of illegal drugs. This podcast is brought to you by Spice Rum devotees Baron Samadhi. Like us, they share a desire for a vibrant and thriving nightlife and celebrate the creativity that only comes to life after dark. This episode is dedicated to Adrian Thomas, famously known as Ajax, dance legend. Ajax! Hey, I'm Andrew Kotman, and you're listening to the Stony Roads Podcast. We knew that we couldn't make a podcast about the Aussie music scene without chatting to the Bang Gang DJ Collective. Born from six mates that wanted to throw a party with no limits, their crew included... Ajax, Jamie Doom, Dangerous Dan, Gusta Hoodrat, DJ Damage, and Double Nolan. They grew to become an unforgettable part of Sydney's club scene, touring nationally, throwing one of Sydney's most iconic parties, and releasing on modular records. We got Gusta Hoodrat to bring us inside their notorious Sydney club night, sharing some insane antics from the past decade and the late and great Ajax's ongoing legacy. When they first started Bang Gang Parties, They'd scroll an ad for the party on a chalkboard out front of their Surrey Hills digs. It read, Bang Gang DJs, featuring all their DJ names. But Gus couldn't settle on the one name. I started calling myself different DJ names, but like to do with other DJs. And so I called myself Gus the House Cat after Felix. And someone had gotten the chalk over the middle of the night and crossed it out and written the hood rat. Like they crossed out House Cat and it just stuck from then. That was it. So whoever did that, Mystery, mystery person out there in the universe. Thanks for calling me Gus the Hood Rat because it's stuck forever. <laughs> it was a combination of a large thing to do based around Dan's fashion brand at the time, Subi. Um, I started working for Subi. I'd met Dan randomly when I was working at a hotel and they stayed at the hotel during like a fashion week thing and I just I was working in the hotel and I met him and I was like this guy's cool <laughs> and we started hanging out and and then I then got a job working for him and Nolan was working for him at the time doing a little bit of design stuff he was at university I don't know how they actually met but then Benny was Dan's brother so he was in the crew and they already knew Ajax who I had kind of known as a DJ and they knew Ajax from the Northern Beaches. Like, they all grew up around Avalon. And I think they kind of, like, had gotten to know Adrian and booked him for some of their parties and become friends. And then Jamie... <laughs> Jamie was... Jamie was our... Um, I'm not going to try and implicate Jamie in anything criminal here, so I went to... <laughs> Jamie was a friend, an acquaintance from the clubs. <laughs> we were hanging in the clubs, you know, and we used to get along. And, and then he was actually... Funnily enough, he was dating one of the girl, this young girl who was working at Subi as well. So he kind of was like, it was just kind of, it was largely based around that sort of fashion label. We were all budding DJs. We all bought vinyl and stuff like that. The only one who was actually like a DJ was Ajax. And we wanted to play at parties and we'd occasionally get booked at small, individually, you know, oh, warming up at, at Middle Bar on like a Thursday afternoon or something. And, and we were like, we want to play a specific type of music and no one's going to book us. So let's just put a party on and we can all DJ. So it was kind of a bit like, it's a bit, it's a bit, I guess, a little bit egocentric. Like I want a DJ. I'm going to put on my own party, but it largely stemmed from that. The Bang Gang DJs, as their name probably suggests, weren't really cautious with their words, behaviour or public image. But in the early 2000s, it didn't really matter. It was more about getting people's attention and keeping it, and they definitely nailed that. We wanted to call the party Bang, because we were just like, that was, that was originally it. It was like, we're just going to like call it Bang, because it's like, Bang, here we are. <laughs> it's pretty simple. But then... Um, I can't remember who actually suggested it, but somehow it was like, it doesn't make people think enough. It, it doesn't evoke anything. And so Bang Gang was like, at least that gets people kind of thinking, like, what is this? And when we first started, it was funny because you'd occasionally get these kind of older swinger kind of types coming down, kind of being like, 
so this is the the bang gang party, right? And you're like, yeah. And they're like, oh, okay, so where do we um, where do we hang our clothes? <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, yeah. And I think back then it was a lot harder that you just sort of saw a flyer or a thing that just said like, bang gang, Friday night here. And then people were like, ooh, I, I'd fancy me a bang gang on Friday night. The party started at the Moulin Rouge in King's Cross, which is now home to a real estate agent for student backpackers. In October 2003, it was a cabaret bar, the first owned by a female in Sydney. And under the licensing laws for cabaret bars, even Bang Gang DJs had to have live dance performances every two hours for the night to operate. And that's where we sort of first started getting involved with like sort of the drag, Sydney drag scene. Because we were like, well, we're not just going to get sort of like traditional cabaret because it doesn't really suit us. So we'll get something a bit more, what we thought at the time was a bit more trashy and interesting and fun. And so we used to just book, Mikey was really close with all like the drag queens and stuff like that. And he just used to book the best shows. So you DJ for two hours and then we'd stop the music and then there'd be like a drag show for 15 minutes and then start DJing again and then it'd go on all night. If you've never been to a bang gang party, here's what it was like for the lucky 150 that squeezed into the Sweatbox Club every Friday. It was still pretty like Ned Kelly country up in the up in the cross. <laughs> it was pretty lawless. Yeah, we could definitely do whatever we really wanted. We would usually get to the club quite early, like at sometimes like five o'clock in the afternoon and start decorating and we'd all kind of arrive at different times and and like you know depending on their work and so we'd start decorating and take us between the six of us or maybe sometimes more like we'd sometimes have friends help or whatever take us a good five hours to set up and put everything up um and we would just that would begin the sort of night the chat you kind of start you open the beer or two and so by the time we would open the doors <laughs> so it was like doors would start and we would usually sometimes you paper scissors rock who gets to open like who DJs first sometimes people would be like oh, I definitely want to DJ first so because then I can get like really really wasted <laughs> and not have to even think about DJing um, so that would happen and when the doors would open you'd kind of the first couple of hours was always a bit like that sort of I don't know it's a bit quiet but it was also all that right time when you really get to know everyone that was like it still felt very social in the first couple of hours people would come down the music wasn't it wasn't like you didn't get in and go for it it was it, it was actually like you know get in and we'd play really kind of chilled out music um for the first two hours and then and then it would sort of generally that when the clock would strike midnight it'd be really like here we go and then it would just just yeah tear the band-aid off and just blood spurting all over the room I guess it's a, a combination of um, like right time right place um, wrong people right you know right music it was it I think it was sort of you know perfectly sized club and as I said before quite lawless you know really felt like when you were in there it was like you can really do whatever you want in this place as long as you sort of you, you respect each other and and everyone's cool that's good you know um, I think also as far as sort of I guess the, the leaders of the gang we all we all were pretty um, pretty wild in our own kind of way so you sort of look up and if the DJ is like half naked, um, you know, drinking a shot of vodka off someone's bum or whatever, <laughs> you're like, I feel comfortable. Gus says Bang Gang was two social groups mashed together. The gay community and gigging musicians. The music was just as random. A lot of parties at the time were clearly defined as house nights or techno nights. Bang Gang didn't define itself as anything but good music to have a good time to. As the party grew in status, that came to include music lovers who wanted to hear something eclectic. Confused and totally misaligned, but there was something that was kind of kind of cosmic about it, you know, like it had that sense of like what you know, this is this is sometimes terrible but like the moments of magic when it really happened it was like this is you can't get close to this um and taking things that were kind of really from disparate 
backgrounds in like musicality and then putting them together and being like, see, <laughs> this can work. And we were also very unprofessional. I think when we first started, there was like that history thing. It was like people were always like, what do you think you're doing? You're never going to, you can't do this. You need to know what you're doing. It was like, you know, ignorant, ignorance was bliss. No, I don't think anyone specifically. There was probably a feeling maybe in the beginning where naturally I think a lot of people don't like a group of people coming on the scene and kind of making a lot of n unnecessary noise. And especially because a lot of our sort of visual branding and um, language that we <laughs> use was quite brash, you know. It's like I'm pretty sure if you put up some of the posters that we used to put up around town to get people to attract people to your party nowadays you'd have like the federal police there within the, you know at the first party and be like what do you think you're doing one of the most memorable times was when drop the pressure by scottish producer milo was released ajax snagged the only copy in australia and started playing it at banking on the regular before it was even licensed for distribution nationally, the dance floor of the Moulin Rouge was the only place you could hear it. That was like, that was the biggest song of the night, every night. It was like that, and then We Are Your Friends. So like these two just, just monster tracks. You could play them four times in a night and people would just keep losing their minds. Um, and we then, we were like, we've got to get Milo out here. One night, Adrian was playing Drop the Pressure and I was dancing next to this guy. And he's a Scottish guy and he came down the club a little bit and he's like, I this is Milo. I know Milo. He's from Sky. I'm from Sky. And I was like, you know the guy that made this record? And he's like, I, I do. And I was like, man, we should get him out here to play the club. This is just part of And he's like, great, let's hit let's him up. So hung out with him all night. He came back to my house. That morning we called Milo in Scotland. At, like, we were back at my house at the Bender. Called him from my whatever Nokia 3310. I was like, hey, man. This is Angus from Sydney, Australia, for a party. Um, we play your record every week. Do you want to come and DJ for us? And he was just like, hell yeah. Like, when? Let's do it. And we were like, I don't know, in like a month or two or whatever. Like, let's do it. And he's like, I'm in. Yeah. So we organized a spot like two or three months away. Ended up like buying his ticket. And we're like, yeah, we'll, we'll buy a ticket. But we can only sort of pay like, you know, 500 bucks. <laughs> In the meantime, the record got licensed in Australia, and when it came out, it blew up like crazy. However, not everyone was impressed that Bang Gang had managed to secure Milo for a club show, and they were approached by the label. We hear you got Milo booked at the club, like, we've licensed his record, we want him to play for us. And we were like, great, good, good you can have him, you know, next time he comes out. <laughs> we're like, it's not, ha like, they were kind of sort of, they weren't muscling over, but they just were testing the water whether they could get involved, and we're like, Nah, man, we like, we booked this guy. I booked him on the telephone. We've got a, we've got a man to man word that he'd do this. So by the time Milo came out, like he was just insanely big. Like I remember it was like fanfare. And I remember that night at the club, it was just like, never seen it that way. We've squeezed like 500 people into Moulin Rouge and people were like crowd surfing and stuff like, and there was like the dance floor was up like here and there was stairs that went up to the dance floor. And I remember seeing people like kind of like crowd surf off the dance floor and like down the stairs. <laughs> and then just kind of end up at the bar, like land at the bar and be like, not a beer, thanks. After a few years of throwing the party, the boys started to travel interstate, touring festivals and bringing their energy to the clubs of Australia. When we started getting booked for festivals, we were kind of like, oh, wow, festivals. My God, this is, this is fun. Uh, but at the time, it, it was all so tied up in just this, like, spending time with your friends, partying with your friends. It never really felt like it was, it didn't really feel like it was growing, but um Maybe I think afterwards when, when like we realized that we could then DJ and occasionally put on other parties, but like didn't have jobs maybe. <laughs> like most of us like still had jobs during the whole time of doing Bang Gang for the three and a half years. And then when we, ironically, we finished doing it every week and then we we're like, ah, oh, now I can, well, now we can DJ at lots of other parties and they'll pay us to DJ and we don't have to work during the week. Soon, each of the Bang Gang crew found a role to play at the parties that came their way. It was kind of everyone at the time. Like it was very much a loose thing and it was always like, 
you could go and play as part of it. It was a bit like, it was quite diplomatic, you know, if it was a gig was booked and they're like, we want three of you, it would always be like a round robin, you know? Okay, those three people would go and do the gig and then the next time there was three people, the next person would step aside and another one would come. So the dynamic always changed. It'd be like Ajax and Dan and Benny and then Ajax and Dan and Jamie, Ajax and Dan and me and then Ajax and me and Jamie and, you know, it would always change. Nolan was never really like, DJ DJ he was always like selector you know he would just come and select songs um, which was great you need someone like that who's not like he's not like trying to mix anything he's just like playing good music but at the spearhead there was always Ajax he started a label called Sweat It Out in 2008 and released music on Modular Records and Ministry of Sound he was 3D Magazine World DJ of the Year three times he travelled the world playing his iconic mixes You'd always try and get Ajax involved because <laughs> he was the best. Someone like Ajax is like the spearhead DJ who was one of the most eclectic DJs I know. He could go and play a hip-hop club and then a techno club and then a house club all in one night. He'd carry like two big bags of records around and, you know, he'd make it work so well that then when it came to being given carte blanche on the dance floor at Bang Gang and he could take the best part of all of those different things that he explored and put them all together and create this new thing, you know? He was our middle of the night resident, you know, like usually at midnight when things kicked off, we go, Ajax, you're on. You could just wind him up and he'd just go for like three or four hours. When I first met him, he taught me how to DJ. He would invite me out if he was playing a show and I would like carry his record bag for him because he often had two and I, and I would go to shows with him and sit behind him and just just watch. And then he would go back to his place after being out and he'd show me records. He'd show me artists I'd never heard of. So, yeah, I learned, I learned a lot of stuff from him. And then he was one of the first people also to show me like music production as well. Yeah, he taught me, taught me a lot. Ajax had been playing for a couple of hours and it was getting pretty hot in there. And he... He would take his top off sometimes and then sometimes he'd take his pants off and be in his underpants DJing. And I remember at a very rare occasion there was no one in the DJ booth and it was kind of like pushed up a little bit into this corner. So you couldn't, you could only see the top of the DJ. And I remember seeing Ajax and we were all dancing and stuff. And I was like, man, he looks so hot. He probably needs a drink. And I'll, I'll go and get him a beer. So I went off and I walked up and he was just DJing completely nude. But no one really kind of knew it. Or maybe some people maybe walked into the DJ booth to say hello to him. They're like, oh, uh, I'll just go back out. Of the day. <laughs> you know, he'd just gotten so hot that like he'd just taken all his clothes off. And with, he wasn't making any kind of spectacle of it all or anything. He wasn't like, ah, he was just, he was working hard. You know how he is, head down, sweating it out working four turntables like a madman. And, um, and I just kind of walked in and I was like, Wow, all right. Here you go, Jaxie. Here's a beer. <laughs> I guess not a lot of people know this about Ajax because he was always such a personable, awesome dude at parties. You know, he, he gave time to everyone. It didn't matter who you were, what you did. If you came up and said hello, he would engage with you straight away. And he, he was, he's completely present. But he's also incredibly, insanely intelligent and well-read, educated person which you didn't you didn't get the the sense of that because he never like exhibited it too much especially when he was just talking to some young kid who's like 18 first come to the club and had their mind blow by him he wasn't going to then drop some deep you know technological knowledge on them right in the moment because he knew that they it's not what they needed he'd come right down and just be at their level but he was a previous or when he was first dj he was a a lecturer at uh, Kofa University on like art history. When we would talk, he'd he'd occasionally slip in references because we were sort of, you know, tighter friendship group and and his references all had to do with deep ages English history or the Dutch Civil War in 1542 or he was so well read. He just always was reading stuff and it was just crazy about history and art and everything that you just kind of, you were often shocked at some of the things that came out of his mouth. <laughs> Ajax taking his first E was pretty good. <laughs> but I don't know whether he can... I mean, look. Yeah, he's not here to defend himself, so... 
I can drag him through the dirt. No, I, uh, that was great. You know, like no one knows this really because Ajax was always, he was, the, you know, the center of the party. He was the energy and you would have thought from meeting him like, this guy is crazy, you know, I want to have what he's had. But he didn't, he didn't take drugs. He didn't really drink. He was actually just completely high off the music. And we were completely high off everything, anything we could get our hands on. And it took us a long time to convince Ajax to, to just, you know, it was like, come to the dark side, Ajax. And I think it was after about a year and a half of doing the party. It was his birthday one night and we all threw in and bought him a little beautiful little golden box with his name on it. And inside the golden box was the golden E. We were like, it's time, Adrian. <laughs> one of us, you're, you know, you've been around long enough. <laughs> um, and that was like... It was like being, you know, I don't know, with a child and getting them getting their, you know, meeting Santa for the first time and just f absolutely flipping out. <laughs> that was a very special night for all of us. His whole humility and being a part of the party rather than being like the spectacle at the party. It's like, no, I am here to be part of this together. We're in this together. It's not me up there. It's us um which always stuck with me because i really i really like that and it always seemed like he took a lot from that and i think i still try and uh, i mean now i don't have to try i think it's just because you just become conditioned when you get older to just be yourself or whatever whereas in the beginning i was kind of a bit like learning okay yeah he seems to i think it made him a better dj he's like the deeper connection with the crowd from the simple thing of having those interactions before and or after helped him become a better DJ and you know that I think in turn yeah being being that having that deep connection is really important Ajax Adrian Thomas sadly passed away in 2013 many find it impossible to sum up his legacy in words he was instrumental in shaping the Australian dance music landscape and is known as a dance legend to this day and beyond. At the end of the day, it was just we were just having a good time with our friends um, and a, a lot of it was based around partying very, very, very hard <laughs> and then getting spat out the other side. And like musically, it was a very interesting time and... I think it, it always has left an art lasting impression on me and my taste and everything like that. Even though the music I make now and things I do with are probably what people would call completely different, but in a sense, it still is like quite mashed up and like all over the place and not very uniform. So it definitely left a lasting impression on what I do. But I wonder whether everyone else feels the same. I reckon Jamie's, Jamie's pretty cynical. If he was sitting here right now, he'd be like, Nah, take it all back. <laughs> did some, did all that stuff, and and you know it was fun and learnt a lot about the world and people and myself and you know how to survive for four days on no sleep and still pretend like you're sane. There's no reminiscing though. It's funny we don't ever talk about the old days. It's all always still just moving forward. This podcast was recorded at Forbes Street Studios in the heart of Sydney. It's created by Andrew Cotman and David Ross. Written and researched by Emily Carmona. Our audio engineer and producer is Dan McHugh. Thanks again to Baron Samadhi Spiced. Rum Resurrected. 